Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. I'm taking a look today at one of the new Copilot Plus PCs that just came out. This is the first one that got to my door. This is the HP Omnibook X14, and this is powered by the new Snapdragon X Elite processor. And this is an ARM-based chip, the same type of architecture that you find inside of your smartphone or on the MacBooks these days. But for Windows, they've been struggling to get the ARM architecture to work well enough to make it a good alternative to Intel and AMD-based PCs. The battery life on these has always been excellent, but the performance has been lacking and there have been compatibility issues. And this new chip promises to improve some of that, but we'll put it to the test as we work our way through the review here. Now, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that HP lent this laptop to the channel for this review, so it goes back to them when we're done. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see how these new ARM PCs perform on the Windows side. Now, the price point on this comes in at around $1,149 on HP's website at the moment. There are a couple of different configuration options available that might make the price lower or higher depending on how you configure things, but this is pretty much in the middle range of the laptop price scale. Now, they are marketing these new Copilot Plus PCs as having a bunch of nifty AI features. I did a separate video testing those features out and found them to be very underwhelming. I don't think they are any reason to buy one of these computers over an Intel or AMD based one. So what we're gonna focus on is how this thing actually works as a computer, doing the types of things that most people do day to day as the AI hardware on here and many other laptop PCs for that matter is really not capable of doing the sorts of AI that you might log into a service to do. Now the uh, machine here has that Snapdragon X Elite processor, again, an ARM-based chip from Qualcomm. It has 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5X RAM, which cannot be upgraded. It's soldered onto the motherboard. And this model has a 512 gigabyte NVMe solid state drive for storage. You can upgrade the storage later if you want by taking apart the computer and swapping out the hard drive. This has a 14 inch display. It's running at a 2.2K resolution. That's 2240 by 1400. It is a touch panel as you can see here, but the Panel does not go flat. It's not one of those two-in-ones that flips around. It is IPS and not OLED, and it runs at a brightness of about 300 nits. So decent display, but nothing spectacular here. Now the build quality on this feels pretty good. It's all aluminum and it's got some rigidity to it. It comes in at just under three pounds or 1.347 kilograms. One thing that I noted though, is that when you lift up the display, the keyboard kind of comes with it and flops back down. So on more premium laptops, the keyboard deck stays in place and the monitor comes up. Uh, here you do have to hold things down just to get everything unfolded. There is a nice webcam here at the top. It is uh, running with a nice manual shutter here. The image quality is quite nice on it. It'll shoot at 1440p at 30 frames per second. It is more than adequate for doing conference calls and all the other sorts of things you might do with your webcam and it has some of the AI features to enhance the image a little bit. What you just saw was the raw image that came out of the camera, but all in for conferencing, it's pretty decent. Speakers are okay on it, nothing spectacular, but good enough for doing conference calls and other things, but not so great for music, although you can, of course, connect headphones to the mix here for a better audio experience, either through a wire or through Bluetooth. The keyboard is quite nice on here. The keys are typical HP fair. They're nice and large and well spaced. So I had no issues adjusting for the keyboard. They have decent travel to them as well. The keyboard is backlit too. The trackpad's pretty nice. Once you disable tap to click, I was having trouble dragging things around and having some of my button pushes misinterpreted. After I turned off tap to click in the settings, it worked much better. Now this PC lacks a fingerprint reader, but it will let you log in quickly using the webcam via facial recognition. So you can get in quickly without a password. Now, as far as ports are concerned, there are not many, but there are some interesting notes here. Uh, you'll see on the left-hand side that there are two USB Type-C ports. This one is your standard 10 gigabit per second port, but this one here supports 40 gigabit devices with the USB 4 standard. Now, USB 4 is typically compatible with Thunderbolt devices, 
And whenever I see one of these USB 4 ports, I take out a few Thunderbolt devices to see how they work. And most of the time, they work just fine on the new USB 4 standard, but not here. So I have this Thunderbolt SSD, and every time I tried to write data to it, uh, I would get errors and the drive would disconnect. So there I was trying to do a speed test, which didn't work. And then here I tried copying a file and it too uh, dropped out before the file was completed transferring over. So I would not trust this with your Thunderbolt devices just because it didn't seem to work all that well with a simple Thunderbolt hard drive that I plugged into it. Now I did plug in some other devices into these ports, including USB-C hard drives, which all worked fine. So I think it's just a Thunderbolt issue that could probably get rectified in a future firmware update. You can also use these ports for display output. Both of these support DisplayPort 1.4a. So if you get your dongles out for HDMI or DisplayPort, you can get high resolution and high frame rate output to external displays. On the other side here, we've got our headphone microphone jack. So you can hardwire in your headphones if you want. And then right here, you've got one of HP's signature USB-A ports. These have a nice little door on them to keep the profile slim here. But if you've got a larger USB-A cable to plug in, it will fit nicely into that port on the side. And that is pretty much it for the ports on this one. Let's take a look now and see how this performs. So why don't we kick things off here with a little Microsoft Word. One of the strengths of these ARM-based Windows devices has been that they generally work with most productivity software quite well. There's very few compromises. Everything boots up and works the same as it would on an Intel or AMD based Windows machine. And as you can see here, things are pretty snappy and responsive. I can tell you from a qualitative standpoint that this does feel a lot zippier than the other ARM based machines I have looked at over the last couple of years. Those often felt like they perform closer to a cheaper entry level laptop or desktop PC these feel a lot more on par with what you would expect out of a mid-range AMD or Intel-based device. In other words, they perform, at least anecdotally here, about what you would expect from computers that cost as much as this one does, which is actually a pretty big improvement. The big issue here, though, is that you get a lot more battery life with that same level of performance. Now, I'm seeing reports of like 24 hours of battery life. I have not been able to run this that, that long doing work to verify that, but the fact is, is that just like my MacBook Air, I have not seen the end of this battery doing day-to-day -day tasks with it. So you will get a lot more battery life out of this, and if battery longevity is very important to you for doing your work, then I think these machines are pretty much a no-brainer at this point. But if you're getting into areas that require more heavy duty graphics and other types of things that are more specific, you might still want to look at those Intel and AMD based devices and we'll cover some of that in a little bit. But for this kind of work, it's fine and you will get significantly more battery life out of this ARM based machine than you will out of some of the other ones. So how many hours will you get? Well, I think if you keep the screen brightness down and stick to the basics like we were just demonstrating, you can easily get 15 hours out of this and it's definitely on par with what I get out of my MacBook Air, which I've been using for the last couple of years. A real improvement in battery longevity for Windows users. Now, if we jump over here to a web browser, we'll visit the nasa.gov homepage. Now, this web browser is optimized for the ARM processor that's on this computer. This browser is called Brave. It is based on the same code as Chrome. And this is a nice improvement because up until recently, the only ARM enhanced browser I could get on here was the Edge browser that has a lot of bloat to it. So now you can install something like Brave that blocks ads and runs a lot more efficiently. As you can see here, things are super snappy and responsive. It feels again like a comparably priced Intel or AMD based computer and that has not always been the case here. So very good experiences here doing the types of things that I think this computer is designed for and who they are targeting and that is a big improvement over prior versions. A little bit earlier, I ran some video from my YouTube channel, a 1080p 60 frames per second video, and just like its Intel and AMD counterparts here, it was able to play back 60 frames per second content with just a couple of drop frames at the outset, but once things settled down, it ran perfectly. So it really is, again, from this kind of stuff, a very nice experience and very now comparable 
to what you would get out of a more power hungry PC at the same price point. Let's take a look at a benchmark now. Now this is version 3.0 of the browserbench.org speedometer test and there we got a score of 22.9 which is very much on par with what you might get out of a new Intel Core Ultra 7 based PC like the Dell XPS 14 that I hope to look at in a couple of days here on the channel. So overall this PC is performing where you would hope it would perform for its price point, and that has not been the case with these ARM processors in the past. Let's take a look now at some more demanding things. Now, a little bit earlier, I did some video editing with DaVinci Resolve, which is a very nice high-end video editor for Windows-based machines, which is also available with a free edition, and they recently released a version of their editor that is optimized for these ARM processors, and for doing simple edits like this, even at 4K60, I'm not seeing any lag or delay as I'm dropping in new transitions and seeing how they look. It's rendering all this stuff in real time, and that's a real improvement over what I've seen out of these ARM processors before. Now here, we had to get the software optimized for the chip because I'm finding a lot of graphically intense stuff doesn't always carry over very well to ARM when Windows has to emulate the Intel instructions, but when you've got something like this that uh, can be ported over, things get a lot better. There's also some aspects of DaVinci Resolve for higher end work that take advantage of some of the special hardware and accelerators they have on board these ARM chips, very similar to what Apple did with their Apple Silicon based devices and their editor called Final Cut Pro. So I think as more developers start supporting these ARM chips, we will see improvements in these higher end applications and this is a great example of that but before we really couldn't demo a good video editor now we can because developers are starting to begin writing their code for these chips now what about applications that are not written for arm processors well one area that microsoft has made some tremendous improvements in is emulation so for example this app is one that i run for my amateur radio hobby and it's called WSJTX. This is not written for ARM. It is an Intel application, but as you can see, it booted up here just fine, and I can turn all the dials and make it work uh, just the same way as it runs on my AMD and Intel-based computers. And this is an application where you probably wouldn't notice that it may be running a little bit slower, perhaps, than comparable hardware, but I have found when you start getting into more complex stuff that things go pretty much off the rails as usual. Let's take a look now at some games. Now, as usual, I got a couple of games that I like to boot up. This one is called No Man's Sky, and I got as far as this screen where you're first loading the game up, and it was looking pretty promising, like something was actually going to happen here, and then things started to go south on me. So as you can see there, it slowed down, and then I got an error message, and I couldn't get into the game. I did try to boot it up again. I changed settings, but I could never get past that opening title screen. And this, again, is one of the shortfalls of this emulation process. Unless some of these higher-end applications are optimized specifically for these new processors, error messages are likely what you're going to see. Now, next, I tried to load up Red Dead Redemption 2. Like No Man's Sky, I got into the menus initially, and everything was looking promising. And then it just sat here for pretty much eternity and never actually loaded the game up. Now, in fairness, this time I did not get an error message but I also didn't get my game loaded either. So we were striking out here on two of the games that we typically run. Now, some YouTubers have been able to get other games to run, but that's the rub. Some games will work and some will not. And on an Intel-based machine or an AMD-based machine, all the games are going to run with varying degrees of performance. You're not gonna have to guess as to whether or not the game will boot up or not. But let's take a look at one that I did get up and running. So here is Doom Eternal, and initially things were looking good, and then <laughs> there you go. So um, a lot of glitchiness going on here that starts out promising and then gets really flaky. Uh, this was at 1920 by 1200. I was getting sometimes 30 frames per second, but it would slow down quite a bit, especially when you got into open areas like this. And this is where those Intel and AMD-based devices do a lot better at this resolution and at the same settings level. We were running everything at the lowest settings here. So it's just not consistent and it's glitchy. Now I did try to turn the resolution down to 720, which is what we're looking at here. 
Um, but as you can see here, some of the uh, monsters in the game <laughs> started glitching out also. It actually looks pretty cool, but that's not what they're supposed to look like. Um, so if you do get your game to run, glitches are likely in your future, and it's just not a reliable gaming experience, even though they've maybe made a few improvements to things. Unless you've got a game that's optimized for the ARM chipset here, it's likely not going to work very well for you. But on benchmarks, it does look like this new chipset has some potential. So on the 3 d Mark Wildlife test, we got a score of 23,585 on the regular version of that test and 5,987 on the extreme version. And that actually bests what you might get out of an Intel Core Ultra 5. And it's also going to best what you would get out of a Steam Deck typically. So once these games are optimized for the chipset, I think we'll see some big improvements here. But developers have to do it. And if there's not enough of these computers in the marketplace, they're likely not going to because it'll cost them too much to port the games over. So the bottom line here is that if you are a casual game player and you want a PC that's easy to carry around with you, these Snapdragon-based ARM Windows PCs are still not there. The compatibility is a big issue, even though it has the potential to be a halfway decent casual gaming device. Now, normally during one of my computer reviews, I like to take a look at Linux compatibility. I was not able to get the ARM version of Ubuntu to boot up on this machine. However, this does have a UEFI BIOS, and I was able to get the ARM version of Ubuntu to at least get to that grub screen where you select what you want to do. So I think these machines will be Linux compatible in the very near future. And it might just be something that I'm missing from a settings perspective inside of the BIOS here. I did turn off secure boot, but that didn't make a change here. But it's not hard to get this thing to boot off of an external drive. In fact, it's the very same process that you would go through on an Intel or AMD based machine. So uh, I do think there will be OS choice here as these ARM processors continue to roll out. Qualcomm is in favor of it. I've read some articles about that. So uh, we'll be coming back to that, I am sure, in the near future. I'll hang on to this for a couple of days. So if I did miss something, let me know and I will try it and see if we can get Ubuntu working on this. But at the moment, it was not able to boot for me. So overall, this is a big improvement over the prior ARM PCs that I have looked at because in the past, you were sacrificing both performance and compatibility for better battery life. Now you're only giving up the compatibility because the performance is definitely there, even if it remains untapped to some degree. I think as more and more developers start releasing ARM-optimized versions of their software, like we saw with DaVinci Resolve, you will get a lot more usability out of these things with adequate performance and great battery life. But if you ever want to play a game, I would suggest not getting one of these at this point, just because the compatibility is very much hit or miss, and you'll have a much better experience with an Intel or AMD-based Windows PC. But this does deliver the battery life, and we're seeing very nice gains in performance over prior attempts. So they are getting there. It's not quite as seamless as the Mac experience is just yet, but this is a great improvement. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Budley, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Steve Green, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.